And welcome back, everybody. It's another episode of Sloth Law. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit of treason with Kramer v. United States. Before we hop into the actual case, do me a big favor. If you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that button. And if you wouldn't mind giving that like button just a little bit of a tickle just till he turns blue, no jokes. I know everybody says it in the videos and it's kind of annoying, but it actually does help the algorithm. It pushes the video out for new people to see. So, you know, more for the party. Again, I really appreciate it. And let's go ahead and hop on into Kramer v. United States. Today we're going to be talking about Anthony Kramer, who was convicted of Section 1 of the Criminal Code, and that's treason. Now, Kramer was a German individual, born in Germany, raised in Germany, fought in the German army during World War I, which, for those of you that know history, means he fought against the United States. And also, if you know history, you realize that after it didn't go so well for them, Germany was not really a place to be in the 20s. And so Kramer left, came to the United States, and naturalized in 1925, got his citizenship in 1936. Joining Kramer in this particular tale are two other German individuals named Curling and Thiel. Now, these two were part of a group that the German government thought it would be a good idea to put on a U-boat and send over to the United States. So in June of 1942, these two landed in a U-boat on the coast of Florida, and their purpose was to disrupt industry within the United States. While there was no testimony, no indication, or even claim that Kramer knew what Thiel and Curling were getting up to, or that they told him, it was important to recognize that Kramer and Thiel had known each other. They had lived together and worked together in the past because Thiel had been in the United States. But Kramer also had basically stayed as far away from National Socialist related things as you could. He had been a part of a pre-Bunt organization, but left because he thought they were too fanatical. He had gone to Germany again in 1936 for the Olympics, but again, there was no indication that he partook in any National Socialist, any Nazi propaganda activities or ideologies. All of that being said, though, Kramer had been German at one point. Not surprisingly, he was against the war with Germany in the lead up to it. He actively refused to work on war materials. He refused to buy war bonds. He had made plenty of statements arguing against the American inclusion in World War II up until the point that we actually joined the war. But after the declaration of war, they were unable to provide any proof of disloyalty in either act or deed on Kramer's part. What we do have, though, is that Kramer took the stand, and what he testified to was that one day there was a note outside his door. The note told him, go to Grand Central Station. So, like you do, I guess, he went to Grand Central Station, where he came upon Thiel. He was surprised for the sheer fact that he thought Thiel was still back in Germany. Kramer denied that Thiel indicated at all why he was back in the United States, but did say that some of his answers were suspicious. But apparently not suspicious enough for him to say no when Thiel asked him to hold on to $3,600 in cash, 200 of which was actually owed to Kramer for past debts. And Kramer, for whatever reason, agreed to hold on to that money in his own safe deposit box. Moving forward in time a little bit, there was another meeting. This time, curling pops up, and shortly after that, both Curling and Thiel were arrested for the, you know, U-boat landing, sabotaging type behavior. Not long after they were arrested, so was Kramer. We have a trial. Kramer is obviously convicted of treason since we're here. But interestingly, the judge refused at sentencing to pass execution, which is an available option when it comes to treason in the United States. Treason is a capital crime in our system. And the reason the judge gave was that there was no evidence, no reason to believe that Kramer was aware 
of what Thiel and Curling were planning to do, that they had explosives or other plans to engage in sabotage. In fact, the judge seemed to be indicating that he was aware that Kramer had no idea what was going on at all, which at least in my mind then begs the question, how do you get a treason conviction? But that's actually why we have the case at all. Appeals happen and we end up at the Supreme Court in this particular case, circa 1945. Now, a quick side note before we hop into the actual legal analysis, this is one of those cases where I get a little annoyed for one particular reason, and that is the judge is a little wordy. This is an overly written case in my particular opinion. Let me know what you think down below. So we're going to take a fairly superficial read through a chunk of this and hopefully just hit the highlights and the big rationale. First, the court took a look at treason in the United States itself. The actual language, it's one of the few crimes you'll find in the Constitution itself, so that's a good place to start, considering that was the conviction. The court had to deal initially with the government's pleadings and how everything shook out. And in that particular instance, they started out by looking at Judge Learned Hand, and yes, that is actually his name, and they tried to parse out whether treason can actually be a charge, you can be convicted for it, where the act is taken innocently in and of itself and treason is only because of some kind of cover or undeclared intent, comparing it in that instance to a conspiracy. The court basically said no, that actually it has to be an overt act, tending toward the accomplishment of a criminal object. That is the manifest of the criminal intent. The government tried to say something else and the court didn't really buy it. They were saying that in order to get the conviction for treason, what you needed was only an overt act of conspiracy. And as a result of this thought, the government said that an act could appear innocent on its face, but that that would still be sufficient to send the case to the jury. And the Supreme Court said that on this point, the difference between the overt act and what it had to show, there were lower court splits, which is explicitly why they were picking this case up. This is now where the big history discussion kicks. In. The court took a look at the history of treason itself, how that concept played against the Constitutional Congress and the formation of our country, and in our case, we were explicitly concerned about continued loyalties to the crown, to Great Britain, which makes sense. It was a colony. We were having a bit of a tiff. We split off. You don't want dual loyalty between your colony, the new government of the United States, and the crown from which you, you derived prior allegiance. And part of this discussion was grounded in the concepts of how broad to write the new laws and how narrow and the implications of government overreach of those actions. There's also just the underlying concept that the United States was forming, particularly at the time, a brand new kind of government. It didn't exist. And so treason used to be actions of disloyalty to the king or whoever your ruler was. They could make the affirmative statement, I am the state, the embodiment of of the government. You trespass against me, it is treason. When you have a representative government like the United States was trying to form, there is no I. It is a we. And so now what does treason mean? And how do we go about identifying it? We also had to take into consideration, as you could see in past iterations of government, say with Henry VIII, who went through several wives and members of his government on treason because he decided that he didn't like them for some reason. You wanted to guard against treason being used as a weapon. And so the current form of treason that we have in the United States was what they developed to protect themselves both against its abuse and against the act itself. And so the final conception that we came up with was that there had to be not only an overt act itself, a simple thought is not treason, but that the government is incapable of creating new treasons and that there has to be two witnesses to the same overt act. This combination of factors did a couple of things to address the founders' bigger concerns, and those were largely that there could be a perversion by the established authority to repress peaceful political opposition, but also the conviction of the innocent as a result of perjury, passion, or inadequate evidence. 
The framers very particularly wanted to avoid kind of that old form of treason that I was discussing before, where you trespassed, say, against the king. Something that you could call treason of adherence, where you could actually engage in treason by simply having an emotional sympathy for uh, a country or a person acting against your country or state, or even just having a lack of zeal for your own country. Maybe you're not thrilled with the behavior of your country's government. In the concept of treason of adherence, the lack of raw, raw, sis boom for your own country could actually be a form of treason. This was mitigated by our inclusion of that requirement for aid and comfort of the enemy, which was defined as an act which strengthened or tended to strengthen the enemies of the king in the conduct of war against the king, and an act which weakens or tends to weaken the power of the king, or in our case, the overarching government. The result of all of that history and all of the discussion about past treason and how it was applied and what should be limited and what shouldn't be limited and what you had to have was the that treason had to be a combination of an action, an overt act, disloyalty combined with that overt act. One without the other isn't treason. Plus, you have that two witnesses requirement to help bolster the entire thing. So again, you have to have an overt act and there has to be disloyalty to the country tied to that act. The court took some time to highlight the intent portion because they wanted to ensure that it was actually intent and not mere negligence. And they said specifically for treason that it's not even a general intent but that the intent must be to betray one's country by means of the overt act the government has to prove anyway. So now that we've kind of dealt with the intent portion, the court turns its attention again to the witnesses and how it interacts with this intention. Because the court's quite right when they say that witness testimony, which is required, is incapable of testifying to the internal workings of somebody's mind. I don't care how well your brother, your husband, your dog knows you, they can't read your mind. And so if the disloyalty portion, that disloyalty of intention, is a required element of witness testimony, then you could never prove treason because you cannot testify to the internal workings of the mind. And so that intention has to be imputed from the overt act itself, which means the court is then tying the witnesses have to identify not the disloyalty but the overt act itself. And they're quite right again when they point out that in law we do tend to assume that every man intends the natural consequence that a reasonable person in the circumstances with his knowledge would expect to happen as a result of his actions. How did the court apply all of this to Kramer himself? Well, they found that the overt acts that the government had actually put forward to show that Kramer had committed treason were that Kramer met with Thiel and Curling with the intent to give aid and comfort. And they basically said a couple of these meetings occurred. That's it. That is what they said. They basically said he committed treason because he committed treason. The facts that they tied to that were that Thiel and Curling met up with Kramer. They sat around, they had a couple of beers, and they talked earnestly for several hours. Now, there were no witnesses as to what they said, what language they were talking in, whether Kramer gave them any information what whatever information he may or may not have given was, whether there was any form of assistance either requested or given. They had nothing, nothing other than the fact that a couple of Germans were kicking back drinking beer. The government realized that their position was a rather weak one. Instead, they leaned into the psychological comfort that being seen in public with a citizen would bring Thiel and Curling. Basically, the government was saying that it took little imagination required to understand and perceive what sort of advantage this would bring Thiel and Curling in the area. Unfortunately for the government, the court said that it's not imagination that we're dealing with. It's direct evidence, and that's what gets you treason. And even more devastatingly, without imagination, the government hadn't brought anything to bear to show that treason had actually occurred. Getting together, as the court put, for a tipple doesn't help Germany win the war. Now, there were some interesting bits in this case. 
And that includes that the court had taken a look at the fact that Kramer had taken that money, that $3,600, and squirreled it away for them. And noted that that behavior was of a vastly, vastly different character in terms of aid and comfort than kicking it back in a beer hall for a while. But here's the thing. The government didn't get proper proof about that fact and actually had explicitly withdrawn those portions from their consideration at the trial. So Kramer wasn't convicted on the fact that he had pulled that cash in. And because it had been taken out explicitly and hadn't been convicted on it, the Supreme Court was not going to bring it back in to help the government out. The government then tried to move beyond that and said that even where you get outside of the overt acts that they did proffer forward, it showed a treasonable intent to meet and talk with Thiel and Curling at all. But the problem is, is talking hmm, all on its own, the court found they still hadn't met the acts portion for aid and comfort of the requirement. And the court explicitly reached back into its prior discussions talking about intent and how the framers had explicitly rejected the concepts of adherence or constructive treason. And as a result, it wasn't going to fly here. Taking all of this into totality, the court found that the government had failed to put forward overt acts that met the requirements for treason. They were insufficient, and as a result, Kramer's conviction was overturned. So that was Kramer v. United States. A long case, but there's some interesting stuff in there. Let me know what you think about the new style down below, and let me know what you think about the court's decision. Do you think it's a good idea that you have to have not only overt acts, and that those overt acts have to show the disloyalty intended toward your own country, your government, as well as a couple of witnesses to back it up? Yes or no? What do you think? Let me know. But until we're together again, I hope everyone's well.